Hey guys, thanks for watching. In this video, we're going to be going over the week 10 concepts for physics 111. So starting off with the universal law of gravitation, we see that the force of gravity is inversely proportional to the distance squared, and the force of gravity is proportional to both masses involved. And we can see those relationships in this equation right here. Um, and basically we see we have this constant here which we've defined. Uh, we see that m1 and m2 are going to be our masses and r is going to represent our radius or the distance from the center of one object to the center of the other. And we can see this equation uh, basically in this diagram as well. We see that um, our r is going to be uh, the distance between the centers of both masses. We have our masses here. We have a smaller mass and a larger mass. And we see that uh, the gravitational force between them is going to basically be this attractive force right here. And it's just important to remember that this is a universal law, so it can apply to any two bodies within the universe, um, whether that be planets or two students. Uh, we can uh, calculate the actual um, gravitational forces between those two uh, objects. And let's do that below in the example. Um, it says, calculate the gravitational force between two students, 55 kilograms and 80 kilograms, sitting 1.2 meters apart. So we're just gonna plug straight into this equation. Force of gravity is gonna be equal to our constant, which we have here, multiplied by our two masses. So we have a student that's 55 kilograms and a student that's 80 kilograms. And then we're gonna divide by um, the distance between uh, their centers uh, squared. So we know they're sitting 1.2 meters apart. We're gonna square that. When we work this out, we're gonna get a force of about two times 10 to the negative seven newtons. All right, so lastly on this slide, let's talk about weightlessness. Um, so let's review what weight is. That's the force due to gravity. So when we hear the word weightlessness, uh, we might wanna assume that this is gonna be uh, a situation where we don't have gravity, but that's not really the case. Um, really the definition of weightlessness is a condition in which the support force or the normal force is absent. So we have two main types of forces. We have contact forces and non-contact forces. And gravity is a non-contact force. We can't really feel gravity. What we feel is a contact force, which is normal force. So when we're sitting down or standing up, we always um, think we feel gravity, but what we're really feeling is this uh, opposing force, uh, the normal or supportive force. Uh, and basically when we have, for instance, astronauts in the International Space Station or a person on a roller coaster that's going um, down a big drop, uh, that feeling, that sensation, uh, like you don't weigh anything that you get in your stomach, um, that's actually due to a lack of that normal force, uh, not a lack of gravity. Because we know that gravity is still going to um, exist in that location on Earth where we're on the roller coaster. We don't cease to have gravity uh, in that situation. What's going on is we still have gravity, but we don't have that contact force uh, that's giving us the sensation of our non-contact force, which is gravity. And the same thing on the International Space Station. Um, we, we don't want to assume that there's no gravity there because there actually is gravity. Um, in order to keep a satellite in motion, we actually do need the force of gravity. So we know for a fact that gravity is going to be acting on the International Space Station. However, we don't have our supportive force giving the astronauts this sensation of gravity. So therefore, they have a sensation of being weightless. All right, next let's talk about Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So the first law, the law of orbit, states that planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one of the focal points. Um, so basically, in this first image here, we're supposed to um, assume we have a pin at each of these two focal points, and then we take a pencil or a pen and um, place it within a string that's around the pins. And as we move that pencil around, it's going to draw this elliptical orbit that we can see here. Uh, so basically what we're supposed to realize 
is that for an elliptical orbit, we're always going to have two focal points. And what this law of orbit states is that the sun has to be at one of the two focal points within that planet's elliptical orbit. So the second law is the law of area, and it states that a line from the sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal lengths of time. Uh, so that's this image here. And what we can see is that during this planet's orbit, um, it's going to take the same amount of time to get from point A to point B as it will to get from point C to point D or point E to point F. Um, and basically, these areas we have here are all going to be equal according to this law. Um, we have the same amount of time, and um, we're supposed to uh, see this as this line basically coming from the sun is sweeping along um, and let's say this takes two months uh, here it's going to take two months here it's going to take two months but um, the point is that with the same time segment um, the sun is always going to sweep the same area within this planet's motion and then the third law the law of period states that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the average radius and we can see that relationship in this equation here. So center of gravity is the average position of all the mass or weight within an object. And it's going to be above a balance point, below a suspension point, and sometimes it may be outside of the object. So next let's talk about rotational motion. So we already know that translational motion is going to be linear motion. And rotational motion is going to be where an object rotates around an axis. So for instance, with this bowling ball, we're going to have a scenario where we actually have a combination of both translational and rotational motion. Because we know that the ball is going to move in this linear manner, which is going to be our translational motion. But it's also going to have this rotational motion where it rotates around an axis as it's rolling. So torque is going to be the tendency of a force to rotate a body. So we see that torque is equal to our R, which is distance from the axis of rotation, to the point where the force is applied times our force times sine of theta which is going to be the angle between the force and r this is going to give us units of meters times newtons and we don't want to call these joules on accident um, and the direction is going to be either clockwise or counterclockwise so let's take a look at the image on the right uh, basically what we have here is a top view of different scenarios uh, where we're applying forces to this door so in the first scenario we're applying our force directly perpendicular to our R. And in this case, um, it'd be like plugging in 90 degrees to our theta. Uh, and this is actually going to give us our maximum torque for this scenario. Uh, and when we apply our force parallel to R, this is going to be like uh, plugging in 180 degrees uh, with sine. And we know when we take the sine of 180 degrees, it's going to give us a value of zero. So in this case, we're not going to have any torque. And then in the last case, we see that we're applying this force at some angle to R. And in this case, our torque is going to be dependent upon that angle. So net torque is going to be the sum of all the torques within a system. So we have a different couple types of equilibriums. Uh, the first is linear equilibrium, which is where all of the forces in that system are going to cancel out, so they're all going to be equal to zero when we add them together. With rotational equilibrium, all of our torques in that system will cancel out. And with mechanical equilibrium, both all of our uh, torques and all of our forces are going to cancel out. Um, but we also need to remember that that doesn't necessarily mean the object is at rest, because we know, according to Newton's first law of motion, um, the law of inertia, that uh, we can have constant velocity so we don't necessarily need a force acting on an object in order to have motion and therefore uh, when we don't have any forces uh, that doesn't necessarily mean our object is at rest either. But then for static equilibrium this is going to be a scenario where we have both mechanical equilibrium and we know that the object is at rest and that's going to be what we have in this scenario here um, with uh, this seesaw Basically, we have linear equilibrium because all of our forces are canceling out. We have rotational equilibrium because our torques are canceling out and our object is at rest. So therefore, we know that this is going to be static equilibrium. All right, lastly, let's quickly cover stable versus unstable equilibrium. 
So with stable equilibrium, we have a system which experiences a net force or torque in a direction opposite to the direction of displacement when displaced slightly from equilibrium. So the force or torque is going to bring the object back to equilibrium. So we can see that in this top image here. Uh, if we have this box, for instance, here, and we were to uh, pull this box uh, up a little bit off of one of its corners, like we can see here, um, this box is obviously going to fall back uh, to where it was before. Uh, and this is a scenario where we have stable equilibrium, this tendency to go back to where it was in equilibrium. And then with unstable equilibrium, we have a system which, when displaced, experiences a net force or torque in the same direction as a displacement from equilibrium. So the force or torque is going to bring the object out of equilibrium. So that would be this scenario here. Uh, we could see that this is um, a really unstable case. Um, basically, um, if we were to tip it in any way, it's going to want to fall over and basically land in a more stable equilibrium. So this would be a case of unstable equilibrium. Alright, that's all for this video guys. Thanks for watching.